Our first presenter this afternoon, Helen Chandler, has looked at how worship engages the senses and the body to create communion and experience of God in today's hustle and bustle world. And I think she has a few smells and bells up her sleeve. No smells. I was sent. <laughs> Please, those of you who are sent, <laughs> no smells. <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us, and write all these thy laws in our hearts, we beseech thee. Good afternoon. You just simply cannot control those Anglicans. <laughs> Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. In these commandments, I hear that the whole of us is called to worship, and the whole of us is called to worship in community with others. We are embodied creatures. We experience the world through our senses, but how much attention do we pay to them in the ordinary activities of an ordinary day? How aware are we of the effects of sensory stimulation? What about in church? What role does sensory stimulation play in our experience of worship? How do the sights, sounds, smells, and movement in a service lead our experience of God through the worship? My interest in this subject began, began, as is often the case, with my own awareness leading to curiosity. It was late summer 2001, and I was participating in a women's sweat lodge. A sweat lodge is an indigenous prayer ritual where participants sit in a circle in a small tent-like structure. It is totally dark. Water is poured on hot rocks, and searing steam cleanses and purifies as prayers are offered. A usual sweat lodge pouring consists of four rounds, with opportunity between rounds to exit the lodge, drink some water, and return for the next round of intense steam and prayer. On that day, in that dark, small, dark tent, our bodies crammed together around the central pit of hot stones. The leader said that she would pour a fifth round in which each of us would receive an individual message. We came back in for that fifth round. I huddled in the dark. My arms wrapped around my knees. Why was I here? My mind mused, I don't feel very prayerful. I don't feel open to receive messages from God. I'll sit through this but nothing will happen for me. It was pitch black. The glowing heat of the stones already doused by the water. Prayers were being mumbled, and I was aware of water being flicked on people. But in the darkness, I had no idea when my turn would be. There it was. Flick. It happened. I was startled. They didn't startle very well, did they? I was startled out of myself as the cold water hit my hot, sweating body, and I heard the word peace. I heard it as clearly as if someone next to me had spoken it. But more than just hearing the word, I knew what it meant. The experience slipped into the archived memory of my journey back into Anglican Christianity. And then one day, I was participating in a celebration of solemn evensong, and the smell of incense caught my attention. 
and the familiar church became an altered space of prayer and my focus taken away from myself. On another day, I was standing in a relatively large con congregation. The offertory hymn was going to end too early and the organist improvised a few extra bars before the final verse. Though I was aware of the activity around me, I found myself floating off into another realm. And in yet another service, I realized I was in the midst of a group of people who were singing a rousing Negro spiritual hymn, and they were standing stock still. The frozen chosen, as one of my classmates calls the phenomenon. <laughs> I was curious. What is it about sensory stimulation that engages us in worship and moves our experience of God? My question. How do the sights, sounds, smells, and movement shape the worship experience? And further, how do people encounter God during worship that engages all of their senses in an active and intentional way? As church struggles to identify and redefine itself in the, cultural, in the current cultural context, and even survive in an increasingly secular world, Many are considering making church more accessible by creating worship that feels comfortable to people and meets them where they are in their everyday lives. Is this the best strategy? Or are we denying who we truly are as church, as Christians, and as a worshiping community? I hoped my research would give some insights into this dilemma. This is a phenomenological study looking at participants' lived experience of the phenomenon of embodied worship and how the stimulation of the senses engages them in their encounter with God. Each person has a completely unique subjective experience, but the phenomenological research looks into what commonalities exist among them. The intention is to grasp the very nature of the phenomenon being studied. We will listen to the voices of six Anglicans from the city of Halifax as they tell their stories of the sensory experience of worship and what it means to them. The people who graciously offered their time to participate regularly attend three different churches in the city. They are three men and three women, ranging in age from mid-30s to late 60s. All have experienced worship in other churches and other denominations. Some are cradle Anglicans, some are not. It may be of interest to the Anglicans in the audience that they represent worshipping communities who use liturgies from the Book of Alternative Services and or the Book of Common Prayer. A phenomenological study is concerned with exploring the question from the perspective of the participants. Thus, I thought it would be pertinent and useful to contextualise their answers by first establishing their reason for going to worship. I asked why they worshipped and what style of worship appealed to them before asking how their senses were engaged and how they experienced God. Worshipping. The act of offering praise, thanksgiving and prayer is central to the Christian life. How we worship may be essential to the way we understand our faith and how we experience God. In the context of this study, we took worship to be the act of the main communal gathering on a, which usually happens on a Sunday. This in no way was intended to exclude or deny other forms of worship, such as personal prayer or community work. The main Sunday service for all participants is Holy Communion, and this is not unusual in the Anglican Church. They also regularly attend other services in their own church or elsewhere, and all had experiences of occasional, occasionally joining other Anglican communities or other denominations. Here are some of the things they had to say about worship. Worship is duty and joy, the foretaste of joy in heaven. I worship to pray that the, the clicker works. <laughs> I worship to keep me close to God. I felt great peace in church, even when I was young. I knew I had to be there. John, <laughs> that is where we go, oops, that is where we go to worship. Sorry about this. That is, it's where God is, that is where his people are, and that is where he would want me to be. 
My reason for participating in worship is firstly community affiliation with people who are there, and secondly, for learning the Bible and theology, which are amazingly interesting in their pure sense and interpreted through what is going on in the world today. There are variations in how and why worship is important to individuals, but for each one of the participants, it is foundational to their faith. As I listened to people, what they had to say about worship and their embodied experience, five sensory themes emerged. A sense of tradition, of music, a sense of community, of space, and a sense of movement. We experience the world through our five physical senses, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, olfactory, and gustatory. How we interpret our experience often focuses on our perceptive senses, and we see this in response to this study. Music and movement relate directly to our physical senses, and tradition, space, and community have more to do with our perceptive sense. Everyone used the word traditional. Here are some of the other words participants used to describe the style of worship they attended. Ritualistic, ordered, structured, repetitive, formal. Does this sound like something that would attract you? <laughs> Maybe not. So why were these aspects of tradition important to them? Using the ordered liturgy of the Anglican Church means people can, come, can go from church to church throughout the world and know what is going on, even in another language. There may be local variations, but the essence is there, and the flow and the form have meaning. The ritual does not impose itself as a rigid format to be followed unthinkingly, but facilitates a gateway into the presence of God. As one participant noted, the liturgy is engaged intentionally each time as a unique experience. The ordered liturgy emphasizes that worship is an activity set apart from everyday life. Speaking about the repetitive prayers of the liturgy, one participant said, I can come into church half asleep or in a bad mood and not be ready to pray properly. The liturgy puts me in a right frame of mind. If I pay attention to it, it sets me straight. If I'm half asleep, I'm forced to think about God's glory and what God has done for me. In paying attention to the tradition, people noted also that there was a sense of excellence and beauty in the creation of worship that was befitting the glory of God. A sense of music. In the Anglican Church, in the Anglican Church, music in worship includes not only hymns, but also the choral mass setting where elements of the liturgy are sung. These might compri comprise the Kyrie, the Gloria, the Creed, the Sanctus, Benedictus, the Agnus Dei, and sometimes the Gospel is sung. Some of these pieces, such as the Kyrie and the Gloria, would normally be said by the congregation, and some sung mass settings have them sung by the choir alone, a point that was noted by some participants, an indication that the congregation likes to participate actively in the liturgy. Every one of my participants mentioned music. It seems to have a way of reaching into our bodies and profoundly impacting our experience. Here are some of the things that they said. Great music and hymns that I've known all my life and I've sung to the Lord to praise him. For another, choral matins is important to me because the music is so profoundly scriptural, written into your heart. Some of the words of the hymns are amazing, said one man, but he also added, in general I think we should keep the hymns short. It gets tediously repetitive. <laughs> and someone else. The music is profoundly inspiring, and it does many things, creates an environment, takes you up with the angels. 
What people told me about music was that if it was good music, it drew them in, uplifted them. However, if it was bad music, it could serve as a distraction and take away from the experience of worship. But what is good and what is bad? A matter of personal taste, perhaps, as one participant said, which renders music an often difficult liturgical subject, as I'm sure we all know. <laughs> Someone else said that it didn't have to be perfect, but there was always a striving for excellence. Interestingly, no one mentioned the actual choice of hymns, except perhaps the comment that some were too long, though there does seem to be a need for meaningful texts. Music certainly has the power to engage or distract. A sense of community. Community is an important part of worship in several respects. Firstly, the experience of worshiping community. We are called as Christians to worship together, to support each other. People spoke of a sense of community during the service. Communicants processing to the altar to take the sacrament, moving through the choir, children running back down the aisle, the awareness of the presence of others, the need to be praying with others. Fellowship after the service is something else that was important to people, eating together and socializing as an extension of the worship. Having worshiped together and eaten together, the sense of community involvement increased. For some, it was through participating in various roles in the worship, as servers or Sunday school teachers, as altar guild members preparing behind the scenes, as lay readers and those who took leadership of daily offices. For others, it was developing strong friendships, finding support in difficult times, being involved in outreach programs or joining groups for Bible study. One person also commented that through the tradition, community reached back through the ages we were not only praying with our contemporary community, but with all those who had worshipped and prayed through the centuries. Here are some of their actual words. Worship seems to be that to which we are called, a delightful experience of the presence of God in communion with our brothers and sisters in Christ. It is the blessed life, the apprehension of God and oneself in God with the whole community. And someone else said, it is wonderful when we line up to go to the rail to receive communion. All the people, the children as well, and the old people, young people, everyone coming together. Fellowship during the service, feeling connected during the service, and then afterwards, we always meet. The sense of space. And no, this isn't an Anglican church anywhere, as my classmates pointed out. The physical location of worship also directed the experience. People noticed the church building itself, itself, the beauty of the architecture, the way it was decorated, and they saw importance in contributing to the creation of the space through cleaning and preparing behind the scenes. When they talked about space, they were conveying a sense of sacredness, safety, and intimacy. The church where they regularly attended was often described in comparison with other churches in their experience, emphasizing the importance of their habitual space. The creation and care of space were also cited in the context of striving for excellence. Here are some of the things that they said. Our church is simple, sparse, not decorated with icons and images in any way. The backdrop of everything that happens here is the gorgeous architecture. We sit up in the chancel. And I found that very special. It is cozy. You can see everyone el everyone's face. And somebody else said, the space itself is very different from what you are doing the other 166 hours of the week. That you just know you're in a different place. It just does. The space is visually deeply engaging and you know you are somewhere else. It was interesting too that people talked about carving out an intimate space within a large church. 
either sitting up in the chancel for small services or gathering around a movable altar set up in one section of the church. In a larger space, one participant found a place to be apart, but not separate, making it safe to exhibit strong emotions at a time of grief. A sense of movement. Aspects of movement are both physical and metaphorical, linked through the intention and meaning and symbolism of the liturgy. Physical movement for the congregation included mainly postures, kneeling, standing, sitting, praying hands, bowing, making the sign of the cross, and genuflecting. And processions, most frequently the procession from pews or seats to the altar rail for communion. And on occasion, a liturgical procession, such as one around the cemetery reciting the litany on the commemoration of all souls. For those in the liturgical party, the ministers, the servers, the choir, there was greater involvement of physical movement in which the congregation participated vicariously through observing it. In a solemn high mass, the sanctuary party perform a liturgical dance of prescribed movements through the liturgy. The movements are symbolic, as in the sacred ministers moving in a circle. An eternal motion, motion proper to God, as one of my participants explained. Participants said they felt lifted to the Lord or that their soul was being moved. Postures, too, have symbolic meaning. Kneeling brings people into a place of humility, into a space of prayer. And when we bow, it reminds us of the reverence of the moment. Here were some of the things that they said. The worship is a whole, and the movements of the worship and the movement of one place to the next is an important part of the worship. I feel my physical body needs to participate. If I kneel, it forces my body into a position of humility that can help mind and heart. Put me in the right frame of mind. My mind is engaged. I need to see, acti Ooh, I need to see activity. I pressed the wrong button, John. I need to see activity, dancing before the Lord. I need to see it. I need to see it in that particular way. <laughs> I've lost it. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, because I need to see it in a particular way, because these recognizable sights, sounds, and smells recall me to something. It is also so different than, one, than one's experience in the world. So, <laughs> it's not my day, is it? How do all these thing, see, themes, themed senses open to an encounter of God? In this presentation, I have highlighted the sense of music. However, people mentioned other evocative sounds, one being the sound of silence. In this quote, the way it is expressed captures the mystery of the breaking of the bread. And moments to listen, to my heart, to God, pauses and silences, a fraction, silence, a wonderful moment, the sentence said, and crack, silence. It recalls for me the temple was rent asunder and silence in heaven for half an hour after Christ's body was broken. The way silence engages my senses. This participant went on to say that it would be a mistake to expect the same response every time. Sometimes the crack is just the breaking of the bread. Someone else made a similar comment about one not expecting mystical moments all the time, but allowing them to happen. Worship is theatrical, he said, but it is not theatre. You're not going to have a big wow very often. Once in a while, you have a glimpse of God, a direct insight. Another person talked about understanding a message through hearing words in the liturgy. I heard, harden not your hearts in the Venite, 
I was annoyed with one of my relatives, and I heard those words. That phrase, I'm sure, was God speaking to me. I've been saying it for decades, but that morning I heard it. I'm sure it was God speaking to me. You have to have compassion and, ch and charity. For another participant, it is all an experience of God. The entire act of worship is a movement into the life of God by the grace of God. And also there are particular experiences of that. The receiving of the sacrament is a very direct encounter with the word of God, feeding on the word of God through these elements. Our experience doesn't separate, our experience doesn't separate into linear pieces. Everything works together. The senses of the physical senses and the interplay of the perceptive senses. It isn't any one thing. It is the whole package that makes worship meaningful for people and enables their union with God through Christ. It begins with the beauty and the richness of the words. But the words alone do not create the full experience. It is how it is engaged. And now? I began with a hypothesis. When the practice of liturgy engages our senses in ways that are unusual and, su and surprise us out of ordinary reality, our sensory experience of worship quiets our conscious mind, our ego mind, and allows our whole incarnate being to encounter God and God's transcendent mystery. The actuality of worship is a revelatory and transformative encounter with Christ. Participants indeed told me that what is important about worshiping community on a Sunday morning is that it's distinct and different from everyday life, that it takes one out of oneself to leave behind daily distractions and focus on God. There is something missing in a church that feels like meeting Christians in a coffee shop, as one person said. Nothing wrong with that. They added, but it's not a time for worship. As we strive to create liturgy that is more meaningful and more accessible to people in the 21st century, especially as churches attract those who are presently unchurched, the challenge is to develop worship that is most, both meaningful as a religious rite and also in bringing God into people's lives and people's lives into Christ as they are lived out in the world. Should we revise worship so that it is comfortable and seeker-friendly? My participants are telling me that the liturgy is an expression of our Christian faith, that we celebrated it, that when celebrated in its fullest meaning, it draws people in, entices curiosity to discover more of the mystery, myst, mysterium that is being unfolded. Should we make it welcoming? Absolutely. But that doesn't mean we have to compromise the depth of meaning of the worship journey. Worship is not intended to be, to be comfortable. In fact, my participant said it can be downright uncomfortable. If worship were comfortable, we would be in danger of being there for the worship itself, enjoying it as if it were a theatre performance in which we participate. Worship is more like an icon, a window into the depth and meaning that is revealed the more we gaze upon it. Worship is something to be savoured over and over, over and over regardless of something magical happening or not. Thank you. <laughs> I was really struck by the way you said music um, uh, causes us to it reaches into our bodies, and I was thinking about, well, I want to dance. You know? <laughs> and I'll How can we be perfectly still? Um, How do people in stand worship? still when they're singing? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are there questions then for for Helen from the? Yeah, this is. We, we need to have you on the tape, actually, oh, okay. if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, they were approximately from the early mid-30s to late 60s, maybe early 70s. Around, that was kind of the age range, yeah. Really enjoyed your passion. Thank you. Pass it to Rick over there. Um, you did talk a lot about music, and uh, some of the comments uh, looked like music that was very well known seemed to be very important, so I was wondering favorite 
lyrics and you know, <laughs> yeah. new and meaningful hymns that speak from a voice of another generation. Right. Um, one participant did comment that they went to a church, it wasn't their regular church, but they, it was one that they, um, they were a snowbird, right? and so one that they, <laughs> they uh, went to during the winter, and they said that the choir there really liked to try out new stuff, as he put it, and, and he felt that they were, they, were, they were doing it for their own benefit and not for the benefit of everyone else. So I didn't get the sense so much that it was new and, and unknown, but the intention behind doing it, you know, so, so yeah. And in all fairness, I would say too that um, I don't think any of my participants regularly attend a service that has what we would probably call contemporary music in the sense of a band or, or whatever, I believe. <clears throat> okay, we'll come back. You might have said, I'm not, I don't recall whether you were uh, interviewing any clergy, but did people talk about being part of the liturgical party or part of being, having a, a, an active individual role in the liturgy as being important for them? Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of my participants was a clergy person. Uh, they, what they commented about was the kind of the dual role then you are worshipping yourself and leading worship, but there's also this kind of administrative piece that's going on. You're making sure that it's all happening. Um, and they were aware of that. They didn't say that it took away or anything, anything like that. I would say, for the people I interviewed, being some part of worship, whether it was altar guilds preparing for it, was, um, or, or cleaning the brass, or uh, was important. For some, pe some people were lay readers. Um, and one person actually who is a lay reader, at, often a lay reader at one particular service and sometimes attends another, kind of did indicate that he, he felt he had a different perspective when he was a lay reader, but not necessarily a different internal experience of, of the worship and, and what it was doing for him. That didn't come out. Yeah. I think there was one over here and then I'll come back. I was late arriving and I apologize for that. So my question may not be appropriate. I gather that the sense is you were looking at the worship service and all the content of that. Did they see the worship service as preparing them to be sent out into the world? Mm. Mm -hmm. I think that um, yes, in the, in, in through that sense of community, that, that it kind of, it's like it started in the, in the worship service. And, and, and then it kind of blossomed out from there. So people talked about worshiping together, that being in community. And then they talked about um, meeting afterwards, like the, the, what we call the hospitality, I guess, of, of uh, gathering together over coffee after the, after the worship. And then from there on into other, other things in the, in the community. So whether it was within the community, in the, within the church community, but also into, into outreach stuff. So yeah, so very much, very much this sense of, of, of taking it out. And I think to me, that's really what is in a way foundational to what I'm saying, which is, which is that we, we worship, that's very important. But as I said at the very beginning, which you may have missed, that, that it was not to deny the other aspects of worship which are uh, taking our faith out into outreach or, or praying in our everyday lives. As, as part of the um, embodiment, yeah. actually. Yes, right, the body, embodiment of the large body. <laughs> Helen, first of all, thank you very much. It was interesting, it was enjoyable, and I, I learned lots. <laughs> so <But> did I. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think you mentioned incense or other smells. Mm. I mean, I've often mm. thought that I I was kidnapped and blindfolded and taken somewhere, I would know if I was being held in a church. 
just because of the, <laughs> the smell. Of the smell. Yes, <laughs> yes. No, you're absolutely right. People did not. If, holy smells and bells, right? Nobody mentioned the smells. <laughs> How dare they? Um, I, I kind of at one, I mean, I didn't ask anything about specific sensory stimulation. I let it come from the people to describe their own experience. But I did kind of push one person. <laughs> I said, so what about the insects? And um, he, his reaction actually was he didn't worship in a church where they regularly used incense. And uh, again, it was the snowbird. And he said that when he uh, was down south, they had gone into a church with incense. And because his wife was allergic to it, then it created a negative experience for them. Um, and that was really, one person mentioned it in passing as part of the total package. Uh, but but not specifically. But uh, yeah, I'm with you. You know, I uh, when I go into a church that uses incense, you know, you you know. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, interesting, huh? Maybe. Which, which and I think the other unusual thing about that is that our olfactory sense is the one that's the most evocative of mm -hmm. memory. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So, so yeah. yeah. So it's, 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 mm -hmm. maybe I asked the wrong questions. <laughs> Deb, and then we'll come back. Helen, in your <laughs> intro, you described uh, some folks singing a uh, rousing gospel song. Well, um, the image we got, I think, was <laughs> standing at attention. And, and um, there was, I thought, puzzlement, perhaps something in your voice there. Did your work uh, reveal to you anything that uh, might help you or us better understand that kind of phenomenon when the um, the embodiment does not appear Doesn't happen. consistent yeah. or to have integrity with mm. other parts of the worship. Of the six people, only one person spoke about their res their, 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 their embodied response. Like for everyone, it was how their it was coming this way, right? So, so, so how their senses were receiving the experience. And only one person talked about the responding. So, so no, I didn't really get a sense of, of um, what we might do to loosen people up. I mean, is it part of the tradition? Is it that people don't feel that they should move? Um, I, I remember Bishop Ron, do you remember the confirmation in Mahon Bay and, and that you were processing down the aisle and I was on the edge of, of the pew and, and <laughs> the, the opening hymn and I'm dancing away. And, Bishop Ron leans over and says, are you the liturgical dance, Helen? <laughs> <laughs> but it's a... Do you think it's essential, uh, inevitable, uh, a requirement that there be a visible um, embodying mm. in mm. order to say that someone is having mm. a deep and moving experience uh, of the liturgy? No one said anything about that. My own response to that is not at all. I, I don't think you can tell from the outside what is going on for somebody on the inside. And, um, you know, it's, uh, I, I think, to especially also to take one incident of something, you know, um, sometimes we see trends of things uh, but, but, uh, in people, but for any individual, absolutely not. So Janice, I think. <laughs> Helen, you, you talked about space, but I don't mm -hmm. think you mentioned anything about light. Did anybody mention whether natural light or stained glass mm -hmm. windows or, or mm -hmm. that sort of thing had an effect one way or the other? Uh -huh. your um, yeah, it, interesting. I, I noticed too that there was very little about that in there. There, were, there was really no mention of actual stained glass windows. One person did mention, in terms of movement, actually, light dancing through on the altar or, you know, the, the uh, yeah, just dancing through, through the windows and, and the movement that that created. But just one. Yeah. yeah, in some ways, it's kind of interesting what was missing, mm -hmm. you know, from, mm -hmm. what, from people's responses. Thank you. Um, because of the nature of your topic, I think you could have gone a bunch of different directions in terms of methodology. Mm -hmm. So I, I, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to hear a bit more <laughs> about why you chose phenomenology for your project. Well, <laughs> it kind of chose me. <laughs> um, when I wrote my uh, proposal, I actually thought it was going to be a narrative study. 
hearing people's stories. And in some way, it was. But as I began to uh, look through the data, I began thinking about, OK, but it's not, it's not just one particular story. It, it's, it's more a bunch of story, somebody's story over different periods of time, if that makes sense, that, that it just spoke to me that it was more phenomenological than it was, than it was narrative. Yeah. I just, uh, out of a quick, well, maybe this is a little tangential to your project, but you know, we hear an awful lot about the worship wars in, in, in our congregations and, and the people disagreeing so much. You, you, you mentioned that briefly about what is good worship or, good, mm -hmm. or bad worship or good music or bad music. And I want to know, do you think that's overblown or are... Um, that you know, certainly the personal taste thing. That is it. Is it just relative? It's whatever you like is fine, and whatever <laughs> I like is fine. But but um, mm. do you, what, what advice do you give to um, pastoral leaders, persons going out into ministry, who are going to be navigating some of that discussion? Or do you think that that um, in our liturgical uh, theology? that we have a way of bridging that and overcoming that sort of uh, deep um, uh, conflict over, over worship. And I'm using the wrong mic again. <laughs> <laughs> um, to take the piece of your question about uh, going out into ministry ourselves, I think it's about finding out where we are, where is our comfort level. Um, and because how, if we are leading a liturgy that truly moves us, like as a leader moves the leader, then it has the capacity or the, the capacity to move the congregation. And, and I think if we are doing something that we can't connect with, then how can I ask? Mm -hmm. Everyone else mm -hmm. to connect with it. So, and, and I think you know, it's about you know, bringing people along, you know, and helping them have that experience that mm -hmm. that's, that that moves them. I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Thank you. So my question follows up on that. I'd like to continue to dig a little deeper. <laughs> Helen, I really enjoyed your um, presentation and love your passion and found that it really spoke to the contemplative in me. Mm. But I do want you to unpack slightly more. I, I'm not sure which church, you know, which churches the people were affiliated with. You mentioned they're all in Halifax. And I know that one of your placements was in the Western Shore. Mm. Mm. And I'm based in Hubbards, which mm. is sort of mm. halfway between. Mm. Mm. So I agree with you that it's what we bring in our comfort level, but we arrive in a parish. Mm -hmm. And each parish has its own way of being mm -hmm. to some extent and mm -hmm. has developed its liturgy. I mean, I go to Kings every once in a while because I just need a hit of that mm -hmm. in a sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> However, in my own parish, I sort of started where they were mm -hmm. and I got to know them and what their styles are. And you've been to my parish. Um, mm -hmm. We're really open with music. I mean, yes. we find <laughs> sacred and secular music too. Um, at times, and you just closed your eyes, so I know that's not. <gasps> but um, so I'm you know, it. <laughs> we as graduates go out yeah, yeah, yeah. into the hinterland, yeah, yeah. and we find what is there, right. and then we move with the people. So you didn't mention anything about your experience on Western Shore, where they mm -hmm. have you know down home country bands and um, and mm -hmm. move you know with the sacred in a very different way than what you're speaking of. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and we deal with a lot of expression, new expressions of faith mm -hmm. and new expressions of um, liturgy, which I still believe is liturgy, but some people would find it, they'd find structure and they'd find recognition, but it probably is shocking too. Mm -hmm. um, so can you personally mm -hmm. see that new, these new expressions that are out there, mm -hmm. and I know mm -hmm. you've experienced on the Western mm -hmm. Shore, yeah. can you, do you feel that you're limited to more of a more formal kind of liturgical expression where choirs are more recognizable and 
music is more recognizable and how does that affect you? Because mm -hmm. you were very successful on the mm -hmm. Western Shore, mm -hmm. I know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So can you just unpack that a little sure. more, please? Sure, yeah. Um, I, it's interesting because I was actually reflecting on this as I was walking along the other day and thinking, you know, how would this have been if I had still been living down the shore and had uh, in, invited people in, in those parishes down there? Would, would this have been very, very different? And, you know, one of the great things about Western Shore, I mean, I, I am equally at home in a King's College or waving my arms in a charismatic uh, um, service. And one of the great things about a parish like Western Shore, which is between Chester and Mahon Bay, there are four churches of, uh, uh, serving five communities down there. And the one of the advantage of multipoint parishes is that you can have different flavors of worship and they attract. So one of those parishes has what I would call a contemporary band, going back to, to what you were talking about. I would say that they, they, were, they were all pretty much um, in the same ballpark as, as um, uh, certainly at least one of my, my, the churches in the city that, that was involved. Uh, as you said, the, the, the structure of the liturgy, the, the order, it's still there, it's still recognizable. Um, to what extent do people actually need to say that's proper liturgy? Um, uh, I, I personally am flexible. I mean, I, like you said, I loved being in Western Shore. I think they, they exhibited the, this huge breadth, actually, of from this contemporary, which was still an ordinary Book of Alternative Services uh, worship. Um, Eucharist. Yeah. Others? Maybe we could just pass that back to the back row back there to Sister John. When I hear about um, having a set up of uh, familiar music, familiar words, familiar sights and sounds, I think of setting up a feeling of safety. And uh, it seemed, it's what it seemed to sound like, mm -hmm. um, that this feeling of safety set them up for their worship. And I just, I wonder about that, and I hear about other people having a different, totally different kind of like new music and so forth, and uh, it would be very interesting to to compare that. I don't know. If, mm. Um, mm. They must be getting their safety from somewhere else, or they're looking for a different kind of feeling. I just wonder about the different feelings involved. Uh, um. I'm not quite sure what you're getting at with the sa what you mean by the safety. You know, one of the things that people said was that um, it may be the same liturgy, but it's celebrated anew every time. Um, and I, no one knew what was going to happen in the sense of you know what it would actually open up in individuals or in the congregation. So. Uh, safety in the sense of knowing exactly what you were going to and you're going to get the same thing each time, I would say not. But more in this iconic sense of, you know, you can look at this same image over and over again, but it's not the image you're looking at. It's what the image is drawing you into. It's what you're seeing beyond the image. And, and I think that was the sense that I got from, from, the, uh, from that, uh, the ordered liturgy. Great. Um, so, one quick question. Um, I think we um, should stop and take a break. And uh, those of you who have other questions can uh, catch Helen later. And um, we do have refreshments across the hall for you. And there is overflow seating over here. You can set up. There and there's some plenty of room because I, I noticed that there's some people out here in the um, North X. So, good. Thank you. Thank you.